Here, there. So I'm not sure if Mark is gonna make it. Uh, looks like uh, Liam is having um, struggles with uh, his tummy. So we'll see. <coughs> All right, well, what I said last Sunday, I wanted to open this topic. And it's something that hopefully will be uh, both encouragement, but also a little bit of a uh, reproof, uh, a little bit of a uh, learning, uh, because um, we uh, sometimes feel down or inadequate and stuff like that. And so I wanna, uh, the title of my sermon, what I want to talk about today is When Am I Strong? And then kind of the subtitle is When I'm Weak. And um, we're going to be talking about this odd uh, paradox in the Christian uh, faith. Is that when we are weak, that's when we are strong. All right? And... Uh, <clears throat> We see that throughout the scripture, this is like very important about Christianity, is this odd um, combination of weak people and yet coming out strong, right? See it all over the place. And uh, it's still true today, it still works the same way, is that uh, uh, God does not really uh, limit our ability to accomplish great things based on you know, to what we can accomplish as, as a human being. And in fact, uh, sounds like from what we just read, right, uh, that actually God almost like enjoys. It actually is his intention to actually pick that which is the least um, uh, admired and expected from in this world to, to, to accomplish much. And yet that is what God uh, will choose to actually do great things. And in fact, it almost sounds like when there is something that's really great, God is like, no, 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 and takes it down. There's so many examples of that. So we'll go through a few of them, right? And we'll, we'll look at, uh, at the first one, uh, would be a First Samuel chapter 16. This is the story that uh, just about all the kids learn about David and Goliath. And um, so let's just look at it, right? I mean, First uh, Samuel chapter 16, uh, uh, verse 1, we see how God is rejecting Saul. And he's telling Samuel, you know, how long will thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And so the preclude to the story is that uh, God has chosen him a new king. All right. Of course, this was, uh, you know, in God's providence and God's understanding, you know, this is not some kind of panic, some kind of uh, uh, taking care of the fire. You know, this, this has been, uh, God is not surprised with this. So, but, but remember, they, the, the, the nation, they wanted a king. We want to be like other nations. So God said, you want a king? So I'll give you a king. And remember what kind of king they got. They got a handsome man. And uh, I don't know if you recall, but actually Saul... Uh, the man that uh, God anointed uh, through Samuel to be the king, Saul was actually very tall. All right, so he was uh, one head taller than everybody else. Now, that's not necessarily considered giant in the Bible. It's just a tall man. And I think he was handsome. He was, uh, he, and, and he was a kind of a celebrity. Uh, remember, the, the, the women uh, really, you know, they praised him. You know, he, he, he killed his thousands, right? Of course, it's not as big as David later on, right? But, but he was, um, he, people liked him. And uh, <clears throat> this is what they thought, this is what we wanted, all right? But what was that about? And God gave them exactly what they wanted. Handsome man that was tall and, and, uh, and a great statue and so on. But now <clears throat> the story shifts, you know, because Saul was unfaithful. He would not uh, uphold uh, God's word. So God said, okay, I'm done with this man and I will have a new king. And so he calls Samuel to anoint a new king. And uh, we'll read uh, in uh, verse 6 now. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab. So what happens? He says, okay, bring your sons and 
Jesse had seven sons. So he started bringing these sons. So the first one is Eliab. And when Samuel looked on Eliab, he said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen his. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel, and Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Our dear are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, and withal of a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look on, look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and arrived to him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So sorry, I, I, I teased you wrong way. I said it's going to be about Goliath. That's the next story. Um, but this is, uh, this, is, this is very important. This is basically the same story, uh, same, same concept. Uh, and that is, um, we have certain idea, right? We go, we have certain idea what God will appreciate. This is going to be a great thing. And yet God has a different idea and a complete, completely different. Sometimes we look from a, from a corner, we would not expect it would come from, right? And I want us to, I want us to, this is a very, this is a very important concept. I think it's a very important um, mindset that we should as Christians have, right? Now remember, I always start my sermon, you know, this is, this, today is going to be a very important message, you know. And so I wonder if I'm ever going to come here and say, okay, today is not going to be as important. You can kind of, you can kind of take it easy, you know. Today is going to be kind of like a shallow message. So every, I guess every message is important, you know. But I think this one is, uh, is, uh, is important for, two, for several different reasons. Well, for one, I think we have an issue. Sometimes we feel weak, right? And maybe we need to hear. Maybe we need to hear at that point. Hey, God is mighty, and He will um, not uh, condition His power to be manifested based on your weakness. All right. So that's what you need to know. Now, in other times, we may feel like we have everything gathered together, right? See, it's the same sermon, you know. And that is like, oh no. You know, God is not interested necessarily in our wonderful strength. He's not interested in the statue. He doesn't need that. He doesn't need any of that. And I like to come to it oftentimes because probably more often in a times when I do feel inadequate, right? I do feel, uh, okay, what am I doing here? You know, uh, whatever I'm doing, right? You know, I'm, 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 I'm leading a family. I'm a husband. I, uh, I work for a company and they put some, you know, uh, authority and responsibility on my shoulders and, and they, they give me a lot of freedom and it just let me, okay, let's see what you can do. So it's a burden, right? Then of course the church and, and many other areas. And sometimes, sometimes it may feel that you may, you feel like completely loser or inadequate, all right? Um, <clears throat> You know that uh, moment when uh, you have been studying and you come to an exam and then you forgot everything and then you feel like completely naked? That's how I felt last Sunday, you know, <laughs> when I lost my notes. That was not fun, you know, but sometimes that's a good demonstration of how it is sometimes that we, we feel everything is okay and then and you're exposed, right? And, uh, but then, hey, um, God is stronger than our weakness. Amen? <clears throat> so, how often we look at our prospects and we kind of look down, you know, but we are often wrong. And the Bible uh, clearly shows us that we, you know, he actually tells him, look not 
on his countenance. That's one of the typical things that we use eyes and kind of look at it and, and, uh, and see and, and we are maybe either very impressed or maybe be very unimpressed and both are wrong, you know, it's, it's, it's not quite like that. You know, we can be uh, impressed by the stature of somebody, maybe the, uh, even their hairstyle and their look, their face, uh, their maneuvers or whatever. And, uh, uh, you know, if you, if you are trying to accomplish something in this world, let's say you want to be somebody, uh, then uh, you may actually go through certain training, you know, how you want to, how you want to convey yourself, you know, you probably, you know, they talk about this 20 second first impression, maybe even shorter, right? So they put a lot of um, effort, uh, people that want to accomplish something, they put a lot of effort. And of course, the people that are hiring, they also put a lot of effort how to read somebody and see, see where the person is, right? And, but the Bible tells us you can be wrong, you know, you can actually dismiss somebody that may be awesome. And you can actually maybe be mistaken by putting uh, emphasis on something that's not r r right, right? So you can be wrong, you can be fooled. And people basically go train to fool at the hiring guy, right? You know, you have a certain problem, so you learn to hide it by trying to look confident and look really sharp and whatever, right? And so the Bible tells us, hey, God, I, the Lord says, he sees not as man sees. For man look on the outward appearance, but the Lord look on the heart. And that's a big difference right there. You know, we are able to assess what's on the outside, but God is able to look inside. That's not what we can do. Now, there's still certain methods where we can kind of peek in somebody else's soul by different uh, measures and different methods. Uh, but God sees everything. God sees uh, right, right inside. And so we should... Uh, Keep that in mind, that God sees different way than we see. Now, we may actually think, I see my inside. I see that I am not adequate. Uh, but, but that's all right. Uh, you know, the, the difference in a, Christ, in a Christian faith is that uh, God often wants us to be at the point of realizing, okay, I, I'm nobody, you know, and that's exactly where God needs us to be, all right? Now, don't you like underdog stories, you know, when you have somebody that's nobody and he just surprises everybody, you know. We like those stories. That's the story that they make you cry, right? Uh, somebody that always like, oh, and that, that is that one that actually accomplished, I don't know, whatever, right? You know, like, um, you know, I'm not recommending the movie, but, you know, the Forrest Gump movie, right? That's a story about... Uh, uh, underdog. Uh, in the Bible, we have the story of, of uh, let's well, David. You know, at first he was an underdog, right? It's just a shepherd, and we'll see that a little bit later on as well. Uh, we see, uh, we see Ruth. The story of Ruth. You know, it's just you know, just you know, you see how she's at the bottom, and there's not a lot of future. The story of Noemi, but then it turns uh, turn, turns different. There's many stories of that sort in the Scripture. So why is it that we like it so much? You know, what is it that we, what is it what is it that 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 makes us cry, and not the story where it was completely expected, and the guy kind of delivered the delivery? That doesn't make you cry. It kind of makes you good feel. There's obviously plenty of stories like that, but that all right, you kind of watch it, keep keep going, right? But the story that uh, you have an underdog that touches you a little deeper. So there is something about. Uh, an odd uh, level of uh, justice that God does not look at the great guy and he gives him a blessing versus the bad, you know, the guy that's at the bottom. He kind of, God often reverses it. And uh, those are the story that makes us cry. Those are the story, and we love it, right? What is it, you know, the Cinderella story, right? And all these different stories. That's the stories that we like. I just saw on the plane to Toronto, I saw the movie King's Speech. I don't know if you guys saw it, uh, but it's about a king, uh, the father of the current Queen Elizabeth. You know, I think he went by George. He had so many names. I think he picked King George later on. But <laughs> uh, he he had a, a speech impairment. All right, um, and I could a little bit uh, uh, sympathize with that because 
sometimes even my speech doesn't flow as I would like it to speak. Sometimes I, I listen to some people and they just go and flow. It's like, wow, that's cool, you know? So I watched this movie and it was kind of touching, you know? It, you know, I was kind of had to a little bit hide because you know, a tear came out of my, out of my eyes. And because it was so cool, because the guy, you know, there was this, there is this scene and he really couldn't utter a word. He would be looking at a speech, he could not read it, all right? And his father <clears throat> was very tough on him and, uh, and he was a great orator. Uh, and uh, so he was actually his second son, so he would not be a king. Uh, but then his brother, the one that was supposed to inherit the throne, obviously we, we know from the history that, that that guy actually turned out to be a bit of a playboy. And because he wanted to uh, marry a divorced woman, you know, he had to abdicate. And, uh, and uh, this brother actually became a king, but he didn't want to do it because of the impairment and because of the embarrassment that he has uh, experienced uh, when speaking in public, all right? Now, uh, so he finds this uh, guy uh, that uh, advertises in a newspaper somewhere that he helps with speech impairment. So they kind of backdoor, kind of uh, found this guy. So, so he had, uh, and he was, he was not, he was treating him kind of like a man to man. So that was also nice in that movie. You know, I'm not gonna be, you know, he was respectful, but at the same time, hey, here we're not gonna treat, I'm not gonna call you your majesty or something, you know? Here, I'll call, I'll call you Bertie, I think he called him, right? But it's interesting because he, at one point, he, he put on his uh, head, uh, 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 like a headset with the music inside, and then he asked him to speak, right? And he got so mad, I mean, he, he did speak, but he got so mad, this makes now no difference. He said, before you go, I'll give you this disc, just take it with you, right? And then he goes home and he doesn't want to touch it and he do, they don't want to see this, this guy anymore. And after a while, you know, he's listening to music, he's mad about uh, the situation, that he's probably uh, going to be facing this uh, situation, becoming a kink and so on. And then say, uh, let's, let's listen what, 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 what he recorded, what he gave to me. So he listens to it and he hears him speak, speak completely flawlessly. Even his wife, she comes and say, and that's the kind of soft moment, you know, it's like, wow, you know? And then they go back and the story goes from there. Anyway, but the, we like underdog stories. And in this case, it is still not quite what the Bible talks about. Because in this case, uh, it is just still of your ability, you just accomplished it, right? And even that we like. We still like, you know, when, when you are completely loser, like, what is, was it Winnipeg or who was it the uh, last, not Winnipeg, St. Louis? You know, it was like, uh, there was this guy that was betting uh, for St. Louis to win the, uh, win the championship. Uh, what was it? Uh, what was it? Stanley Cup, was it? What was it? Oh, yeah. You can't kind of forget to follow it much, you know. So they were like, you know, they were the least expected to, to, be, to be the winners, right? But then some guy bet it heavily on that team and he, he made hundreds of thousands of dollars because they actually won. So we like uh, underdog stories. Um, let's look at now another story where we have an underdog, all right? And that's 1 Samuel 17, 23. The reason I'm talking about this is that we're not talking about St. Louis hockey team. We're not talking about King, uh, how he manages uh, to overcome his fears and so on. But we're talking about divine intervention and in divine uh, interference in our inability. So it's a little bit different. Oh, it's actually quite very different, right? And that's what I'm going to talk about. So let's just look at 1 Samuel 17, verse 23. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard him. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him, and were sore afraid. So what is the context here? Well, the context is that we are uh, facing an enemy which is superior to us. All right? They may not be necessarily as an army superior, but because they decide, hey, let's have Let's have champions fight, and then whoever wins is going to be the winner. So they have they put forward this giant, Goliath, and uh, Goliath. You know, the, the guy has armory that's just extremely heavy. I mean, you can 
you know, what is, what is the spearhead is like, I don't know, some crazy weight, you know, uh, so, so it's a really, really odd person. And uh, the Bible tells us that all were sore afraid. Sore afraid means excessively. All right. And this is what uh, we're talking about. We are weak. And when you're weak, you're sore afraid. You're really in trouble and anxious. And uh, it doesn't look very good. The prospects of victory are grim. And the prospects of being in bondage and getting in some kind of trouble are very high. So you're really, really stressed out. We just don't have a guide to face this fellow. Very, very tough. And the man of Israel said, Have you seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the, the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the man that stood by, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth the Philistines and taketh away the approach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, one thing that we like to see in David, this is a pure heart. And that is, who the heck this guy thinks he is to speak like this against our God? I, I like it. Right? I like the motive, too, that he is upset that somebody can blaspheme God and speak these uh, great words. And by the way, by the way, we study prophecies at home, right? We're doing revelations. We're talking about Antichrist and Christ. That is a picture of Antichrist. Goliath is a picture of Antichrist because we know, remember that one horn that comes in place of the three other horns, you know? That speaks uh, great and mighty things uh, and blasphemy against God, right? So we see this is a picture. And of course, when we see Jesus come here and Jesus, when he came, he came as a baby, right? He didn't look like a very dangerous person, right? Uh, but he is facing this mighty Goliath. He's, he's facing Roman Empire and Herod and all the might and everything. And uh, he's the one that destroys them completely. All right? On the cross. And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killed him. So they explained to him what will happen. There's going to be a reward. His family basically will be uh, uh, tax exempt. That's what it means when it says free, all right? So they will not have to pay taxes. They will, they will be spared of certain duties that ordinary men uh, will be subject to. Now, verse 28, we keep reading this. And Eliab, his older brother, heard when he spake unto them. And remember, Eliab is the oldest guy, right? So he's probably, you know, it's the firstborn. It's the, it's that, that's the greatest. That's the strength of the father, right? Uh, that's where, this is what, uh, when Samuel saw him, right, he testified. Wow, well, this is, what did he say exactly? He says, surely the Lord's anointed is before him, uh, because he looked at Eliab. So Eliab looked like a pretty decent, you know, mighty guy, right? So this is the man that now says to his uh, uh, brother David, uh, I said they were seven brothers, I have a feeling it was more Eight. I think David was the eighth brother. But anyway, Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why oh, camest thou uh, down uh, thither, uh, hither? And with whom uh, hast thou left those few sheep uh, in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thy heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. <clears throat> All right, so what is this? All right? This is a lesson given to us. So we're not just reading this as an interesting story, but we see that in our days, in our lives, right? We will see scoffers. They will come, who, who, who are you? Where did you come from? And it's funny how he puts it. Where did you left those few sheep? You know, a you know, few sheep is what we have in our backyard. That's a few sheep, which is like, what is it now? Like, I don't know. Five? We got five? We're down to five. You know, so we had, we had roughly ten, right? That, that's few sheep, you know? Now, I don't think they have, the, the David is up uh, uh, somewhere in the mountains, you know, taking around ten sheep. I bet you it was a lot bigger number. And uh, I, uh, in, 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 when I was, uh, you know, like a university student in my 18 years and, and early 20s, we would uh, travel to Romania and, and go 
hiking in the mountains. And uh, there is uh, shepherds, and they spend their, the whole winter, excuse me, the whole summer. Um, uh, and they still do that today. I would like to go back and see that again. I really would like to go back. Uh, and uh, it's like uh, they, they're out of the world. It's like going back three, four hundred years. That's how they live up there. It's really interesting, all right? But you know what? Uh, it's just a few guys. And you know what? They don't have a few sheep. They got a lot of sheep. And I expect it was the same thing back then, right? Uh, I think uh, I think it was uh, definitely over 100. You know, it's like a good amount of sheep. You know, something not not so easy. But he says few sheep, right? What is he doing, right? He is making him look uh, really small and really look kind of dumb. And you're just a kid, and you know. And uh, unfortunately, we live in a tough world, and we will get that. That people will look at you and say, who is this guy? You know, how big is his church? Or, you know, where does he come from? You know, like, and you, ha you will have that, all right? We talk about green, right? In the beginning, right? Sometimes you can have, uh, and it's okay to talk about a person that's an experience, he needs to learn, but sometimes uh, people will, you know, really push that, right? Yeah, so uh, who, who, who do you think you are? It's just green, right? Yeah. So that's difficult. And uh, we will experience that maybe sometimes even without anybody telling us. It's just this inner voice will tell us, what are you doing here? You know, like, what do you pretend to be? You know, that's, that's what it is. This is a voice <clears throat> that must be rejected. And look what David says. Look what we read here. And David said, what have I done, done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another. And we can learn from this, okay? You know what you need to do? Stop listening to that. Right? You don't, you don't, you could also, and I think a lot of people will do that. Uh, because you may even feel yourself like that, right? You're just a little kid. And you indeed, you know, just with a sheep or whatever. And now you come to this mighty army and there is a king and you see these mighty guys. And one of them tells you, who, who do you think, you know, go back home, right? And then so you pack your fiddle and say, go home. And you shouldn't. Now, if you are there for a reason, then stay there, right? You just have to stop listening to this nonsense. Because if you listen to that, you may start thinking like that. It's not good. Um... Let, uh, let not uh, incur discouragement, either in your own head or from somebody else, you know, discourage you. Uh, wait, for, wait for the right thing to happen and for the Lord. 31. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail before him, because of him. Uh, thy servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but youth. And the man of war is a man of war from his youth. Right? So in this case, it's not scoffing. It's not what he's, we saw from the brother. Right? But it's almost even harder. Because now you're talking to somebody that talks to you with certain respect. And of course, Saul knew David. I mean, he played for him hard. And he's, so, so it's almost harder. Now it's somebody that talks to you a sense. And, you know, so now it's, it's like, a, you know, it's getting harder. The discouragement is getting tougher. And you say, you're not able. You know, now it's rational. Right? Look, this guy has been training from when he was a kid. You, you're just, you know, you're good on guitar. But, but you know, this is, diff, this is different. This is guy's game. But essentially, it's the same thing, isn't it? It's just a little bit more respectful. Um, and uh, uh, David says in verse 37, The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of lion and out of the paw of the bear. And I skipped over a few verses just for the sake of time. You know, but I want to highlight the fact that David uh, has an experience and he attributed his past successes, which is killing of the bear and killing of the lion. He attributed it to the Lord. It says, the Lord delivered me. And I think uh, we need to build our confidence, not on our ability. Because if we do, then Saul comes and says, you're not able. And if all your trust is on your own ability, 
and you will hear this, then you will probably concede. They say, yeah, you're right. I still have to train some more or whatever, right? But the Bible tells here us a story that God delivered David and he felt that way. And he says, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. So what it is, we see a person that experienced in the past a great and mighty work from the Lord. And this experience translates into expectation that it will happen again. So when we are exposed to, to difficulty, to tough challenge, and the Lord delivers us, that really makes you stronger. That really gives you great confidence that God will deliver you. I, I have experienced, I'm sure all of us have some level of experience where we see, you know, when you're a completely young Christian, perhaps there's not many experiences of this sort, right? But as you grow and as you go, you go through difficult things and it looks very gloomy, but then you get through the other side and it's over and you're a little bit different person, right? And the more it is, and maybe the challenges get bigger and harder, the more our faith grows and we become confident, and we become uh, aware that even though I'm just a kid, I'm just a sheep man, I'm just a whatever, guitar player, God can take you and uh, do a great and mighty thing. And uh, uh, that is the premise of my message, that I want us to learn from David, and learn from people like David in the scripture, and have that kind of attitude. There's nothing impossible for God to do. Now, I have this uh, uh, mystery soul in my home that comes and writes certain things on the board in my office. And uh, I wonder who that mystery soul is. I think it's Timmy, probably. I don't know. But, uh, you know, but the Bible says, uh, the Bible, the, the board says, uh, the Bible says, actually, it's a scripture from, uh, from uh, I think, Psalm, and say, you know, who knows if God can deliver through many or a few. You know, but he can deliver. Love that. Appreciate that, Mr. So thank you to me. <laughs> Sorry, it's right. I don't know. So um, the, uh, the next verse that we hear is verse 38. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put an, a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go for he had not proved it. I'm not really familiar with the word essayed, but we can appreciate that it's probably talking about he would not go like that. Okay, it's not his way. But the Bible says, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with this, for I have not proved them. So this is another thing that happens. Sometimes if you are, according to uh, the wise men of this world, if you are indeed going ahead and they let you go ahead, then they will tell you how to do it, right? And it's kind of funny because if you know how to do it, why don't you do it yourself? I mean, you're the guy that's experienced, right? So you don't know how to do it, but you tell me how to do it. I mean, how does that work, right? But you'll have that, you know, you will have people. Um, See, when you come to a battle, you're going to go to the battle the way you are. And you're going to have your own way, which is going to be different than uh, the other way. But how often people, you know, come up with a certain methodology and they want you to, to adopt the technology. And the problem what happens, when you start to do that methodology, you probably fail because you haven't proved it, right? It may be a good method, but it's not your method. You've got to go your way. And uh, that may be also difficult to, you know, because what it is here, of course, Saul is concerned about David. Okay, so, okay. I don't think he really expects that he's going to succeed, but he's maybe trying to protect him. Or what is it? You know, this guy is determined to go. Okay, man, at least let's do something, you know. But David cannot take it because he has not proved it. And um, what is the lesson for me from this? So obviously, first of all, do not trust, uh, you know, the thing that you haven't proved. And uh, do not trust, um, um, you know, even the advice of somebody that's perhaps experienced in the battle. You know, the, the thing is, and, and, and I don't want to, 
I don't want to, you know, in another sermon, I will talk about uh, something else, and that is to learn from somebody that's better than you, right? So you're going to have to square these two things together somehow, you know? I'm just emphasizing right now uh, the thing that uh, sometimes we have to rely on the Lord and not on the man, all right? And I think this is the time where you don't listen anymore to the experts, because you are experts and you're sitting here, you're not doing any progress. So let me just do it. But then let, let, let me tell you how to, well, no, you know, I'll just go the way. And it's funny how, you know, it continues. And David put them off, verse 40, and he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip, and his slink was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistines. So David is not going without any equipment to the battle, but compared to the one that he was receiving from Saul, it's like, uh, I don't know, it's like, it's like taking, it's like uh, using a, a beach uh, tools, beach uh, toys to go and, uh, and dig a foundation for a house. It's just, right, it feels so inadequate. You get a few rocks and a stick, you know. But that is proven. That's what he used in, in, in previous battle. He was skilled in that. It looks simple, but David knows that this, the, 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 the victory was uh, through the Lord. And so he's using to what he's used to and let God do the rest. All right? Well, let God do the battling, actually, right? And, you know, we know how the battle goes on. I mean, David actually slings a stone. And I don't know if David was really that good. You know, in, because I would imagine there was a certain distance. And, but I know that you can get really good with a slingshot. So maybe he was really that good. But I have a feeling that maybe, maybe God just makes sure it just comes right where he needs to go. Right? Just, you know, the stone wants to go a little bit to the side. David kind of missed it a little bit. But <laughs> yeah. You're not curling. Eh? It's just like God is doing curling, you know, sweeping and make sure it just got right there. And Goliath is down. And that's uh, the, the might about, uh, 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 of the Lord. That you can go with very basic tool. You can go completely without nothing. And God will bring tremendous victory. Can I, should I open uh, the topic of Gedeon? How he came to the battle with the 300? You know? I mean, that, that's the same story. Uh, should I go to the, uh, the battle of... Uh, what's his name? Um... Actually, I have it here, so we'll talk about it in just a minute. So there is uh, the issue of underdogs that uh, we may feel a little bit like underdogs. And to be honest, as we read it there, sometimes it feels like God is indeed picking out people that are not so wonderful in, God's, in this world's eyes. And God is choosing them to do great and wonderful things. <clears throat> now, with regards to champions, let's think about Goliath a little bit, all right? Or people like him. Uh, Obviously, in this world, and, and again, um, I will obviously emphasize certain aspect of, uh, uh, of champions and certain aspect of going to the battle. Uh, the Bible says that do you see a diligent man in his craft? Know that this person will you know, succeed and will stand before kings. So the Bible actually promotes us to learn to be diligent, to supply quality, and to be crafty, and to be smart, and to be good at what we do as opposed to be a sloppy person, you know? A uh, sloppy person, yeah, you can get a job, but you're not gonna probably excel. You're not gonna be paid high, right? And I think uh, clearly we should be people that are diligent. They do a good job, all right? Now, having said that, um, people that look up to champions is people put all the stock in just that all the diligence and quality and superiority and so on. You know, the best thing money can buy. You know, the, the, the rich people of this world. Uh, whatever is the fastest, whatever is the strongest, whatever is the biggest, best, 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 right? And then those people, you know, you see, uh, you know, it's say in wrestling and boxing. You know, if you, if you have to pick one boxer against, you didn't see that person, but you know a great boxer is coming, you're going to pick the best boxer, you know, some Mike Tyson or something like that. Yeah? Let's get the best guy and hope for the best, right? That's the world's mentality, all right? Um, 
So the question is, where do we look up to them? Do we have that tendency? Do we have that in our heart? Do we look up to somebody that's really good boxer? Or do the, the fastest guy or the greatest orator or greatest uh, whatever it is, all right? And you know what, let's not, and again, you know, like if somebody has a certain tools and he goes with them to the battle, then all power to him, right? But you have different, you know, you're a different person, different skills, different background, different everything. And so let God do a great and mighty work through you, and it's going to be a different way than through that other guy. Uh, some trust in chariots and some in horses. Yeah? People look up to and seek certain uh, superiority over the enemy. And what is it? We need to have a better weaponry, right? There's a lot of that. The armament of uh, competition and race, you know, it's who's going to have a superior weapon? Because if you have a superior weapon, you know, like the nuclear weapon, kind of settled everything, right? Whoever got the atom bomb first was the winner. Right? Superior bomb had a huge uh, capacity of, of, of impact and so on. But the Bible says, some trust in chariots. Let me put it this way. Some trust in nuclear bombs and some trust in Mike Tyson and some trust in, uh, I don't know, great uh, speeches or whatever. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. So whatever it is for each of us, you know, we need to replace that. Because I realize we don't trust in chariots nowadays. Right? Um, and we don't trust in horses. I mean, I don't even know how to properly ride a horse, you know. But I have my horses, right? I have my tendencies to put my trust in certain things. And the Bible says that's not a good place to put our trust into. All right? It could be connection to certain people. Some people put a lot of trust in that, right? Allies and everything like that. Uh, it never works. It never works. And you have to pay high for it. Um, also, uh, we read in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now, uh, let's go there, all right? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, and by the way, a lot of this stuff is written in Corinthians. Because Corinthians, there, there was a lot of issue about boasting and a lot of uh, issue about, you know, arguing who's the best speaker, right? You had Apollos and Paul and... You know, and, and I'm with Apostle, I'm with that guy, you know, this fighting. And actually, one of the problems with uh, Corinthians is that kind of look down, or at least a section of them, they kind of look down on Paul for a certain reason. We'll, we'll see that. Um, they didn't think he was, I mean, we read it today, and we need Paul was a great man of God. And we don't quite realize that actually Paul had a certain infirmity, probably in his physical presence. So we'll see that in here. But the Bible, see, we, we read it in uh, verse 18, 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. So first of all, we realize here that uh, even our message and our religion is kind of dummy in the eyes of the world. Of the world right? It is, it's not as... You know, it's kind of weak. We're talking about crutches, you know, as opposed to, you know, go get them, right? Be a champion. Be strong and so on. And it feels like it's just so lame, Christianity, proper Christianity. And it's too bad that some Christians try to make Christianity as champion, you know? Like, uh, like Joel Osteen, right? Like, what does he have? I think they have this uh, song they always play just before he comes to the scene. And I think... There's something about champion in me, you know, let, go, let me find, you probably know, right? You don't know, yeah? But they have something about champion, so they spin the word champion in a positive way, you know? And, uh, and of course, uh, this whole idea about prosperity, God wants you to be strong, God wants you to be successful, and so on. I don't know, it's just not what I see here, right? It feels like God is okay if we are weak, you know? It's like, just trust me, all right? Uh, you know, so... <clears throat> even our message, even our religion, is very lame in the eyes of the world. But to us, it is not lame. Because why? Because it is the power of God. And the word power means exactly that. Power. Right? As opposed to weakness. You know? And people may look at us, people may look at David, and they may see weak, inferior, just a kid. You know? And Gideon, did you know that Gideon was shy? Remember Gideon was hiding the stuff and then he ran away? 
right? Gideon was not there. He, he was not there standing like, I don't know, uh, Clint Eastwood. You know, it's like, you know, you're not getting over my dead body. No, I mean, he was in some ways weak, right? He kind of didn't like them, so he, would, he, he was like me, you know? Kind of like do his own thing, but then, you know, kind of hiding. Uh, that's how we are. We have infirmities and we have weaknesses. And uh, sometimes we see uh, certain boldness among us, but sometimes there is not boldness. And uh, nothing to be necessarily proud of, all right? But the encouragement here is, hey, it is the power of God. The message of the cross, the preaching of the cross is very powerful. And uh, we may look weak, but um, who cares? For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. God promised that he will, uh, in, in the long term, in the long term, we will see that those that look weak uh, will actually prevail. And those that uh, look so wonderful and, and, and great and successful, they will be destroyed. I, he says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the dispute of this world? See, the, the point is this. There will come a point, and we'll be looking for them. Where are they? And they'll be gone. All right? Because it's, it's not lasting uh, uh, st st state of, uh, uh, of strength. It's not lasting. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man. And let me remind you the story where Jesus asked his disciples, so what do people say that I am? And then later on, Peter says, thou art the Christ, you know. And then, but later after, when Jesus tells them, but the Son of Man must be given and will be killed by the Gentiles, then Peter takes him aside and he starts to rebuke him. And he says, no, no, you cannot do that. You know, because Peter has a fleshly mind. And for Peter, what Jesus started saying was a foolishness, right? Uh, Jesus, that's, that's weak. Right? Jesus, that's, 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 no, 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 you're strong. You want to be out there, right? And of course, this, we, we follow that, this struggle with Peter when, when, he, when he goes and he chops that ear from that uh, soldier, right? You know, he wants to be bold, he wants to be strong. And yet Jesus looks so weak, all right? Uh, I talked about it the other seven, so I don't want to repeat everything. But the point is, preaching of the cross is a strong and powerful thing. And let's not uh, forget that, and let's not, uh, uh, you know, start thinking like Peter, you know, telling Jesus now you want to be strong and so on. <clears throat> Jesus is strong anyway, all right? It's just a different way. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. I find it interesting because I don't know God is weak in any way. But, you know, even the, I guess the point is this. Even the greatest uh, might that this world can produce doesn't even match the weakness of God. And of course, there's no weakness in God. So it's a little bit the same thing as all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, right? Whatever we can produce, whether it's a good thing in terms of righteousness or whether it's some kind of power, it's like, you know, it's nothing. It's like, I remember that we had this guy, he came to our church back in uh, Europe, and uh, he... He was a cowboy from Montana. And he says, you know, if you take all the great things uh, that you have accomplished and you have done, God can take it and kind of pack it. And he pack it into this little tiny ball. Right? And then he would put it into the butt of the ant. And in that butt of the ant, it would be like, you know, bouncing a little tiny nothing. You know, so that was his way to explain it. I thought that was kind of cute. <clears throat> we keep reading 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. 
But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised has God chosen. Yeah, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So what do we see here? Um, we see that uh, God actually has chosen. He hasn't chosen us because we are wonderful. So let's not try to sell it to him. He has chosen us because we are weak. Somehow he has chosen. And, and isn't that true that people have closest to the Lord when they are weak? You know, uh, it's very difficult to get saved somebody that's powerful and mighty, right? Everything is good in life. If you have a lot of money, very difficult to get saved, right? But who was, who was often saved? It was the publicans, the sinners. Um, I got saved when I was having trouble. I guess I was not necessarily at the bottom of everything, but, but I got saved when I was low, when I was weak. Uh, the Bible says that no flesh should glory in his presence. Everything God does, it will be, he will take glory for, for, for the things that he has done. <clears throat> And we see this uh, principle often demonstrated in the Bible. You have uh, Jacob and Esau, right? Who did Isaac prefer? Who did he prefer? Prefer Esau, because he was a mighty hunter, and, and he liked him. He was an outdoor man, I suppose. I don't know. Where Jacob, he, you know, the mother preferred Jacob. And, uh, uh, but who did God prefer? You know, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. And I... You know, I don't think he's talking about those two personal two men. But uh, out of these two guys came very different nations. You know, you had a nation of faith. A lot of problems there, but still, nation of faith. And then you have a nation of Edom, which was a nation of, uh, you know, no faith at all. You have uh, Ephraim over Manasseh. Remember, Jake, uh, uh, Jacob was going to uh, bless, and he kind of switched the hands. And then Joseph, Joseph came, no, 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 this, this is the firstborn. And uh, Jacob says, no, you know. And it's interesting because Jacob was the one that uh, was born second, but he wanted to have the first right, you know. But, and now he switched the hands. So that's kind of interesting. But again, um, we have a Solomon over Absalom, right? So let's think about Absalom, mighty guy from a proper marriage, everything cool, right? And then you have a Solomon. I think about Solomon pedigree, all right? comes from uh, this weird marriage, how it all started. And yet that is the boy that God loved. You know, uh, God thinks differently than we are. God, God has different, different, of course, the whole uh, nation of Israel. You know, God didn't, God tells the nation of Israel, he tells them, don't you think that I have chosen you because you're so wonderful. I have chosen you um, in spite of your weakness and, uh, and I made you up, you know. All right, so we're talking about champions, and let's remember that uh, God is not impressed with the champions of this world, and yet we may be sometimes. So let's put our trust in where it belongs. Um, so we may think low, or we may think too high. You know, we may think too low. I'm nobody. I'm nobody. Uh, maybe I have to become somebody, but who knows if I ever become that kind of person. I'm not like him or her or uh, that sort of thing. And you know what? You may be right. You know, may, maybe you're right that you're nobody. All right. But maybe this is where God wanted you in the first place. You know, maybe you thought you were somebody. He wanted to bring you to, some, to, to somewhere where you realize, OK, I, I am not really what I thought. I was I, I, we all struggle with pride, and so do I. But I tell you that uh, as a teenager, I was full of confidence. I can do great things. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, I, I have to learn and realize that uh, no. And God uh, dragged me through a lot of uh, even humiliation to expose my weakness, you know. And, uh, but you know what? Uh, Apostle Paul says, you know, he says he will... He will glory, does it say here? 
uh, it's not here. It's, I think it's the scripture that uh, Daniel read at the beginning. You know, it says that he will rather glory in his infirmities than uh, in his uh, strength, you know. And, and God obviously chooses the base things of the world uh, to confine those that are wise um, and wonderful. <clears throat> so again, you may be right. Uh, maybe you first uh, were too high and God had to bring you low. Um, I, I, there's few examples in the Bible. I, I can think of uh, at least three or four. We have uh, the battle. Remember the story for, at the end of the book of Judges where you have uh, Benjaminites uh, sod, uh, sodomizing this, uh, this concubine of this, of this man, right? And then what follows is this uh, battle. And so what a nation back then, right? It's like, my goodness, what's going on here? And they would come down, Benjamin, you know. You know, hold no your breath, it's something like that to happen in our country, you know. But back then, there was a, so, such a moral standard that the people realized, oh, this is so dirty, we got to do something about it. But what happened, they go to the battle, they get uh, beaten, right? Because I, I think what's happening with the people is uh, they put a lot of trust in their own thinking. And you can study for yourself, I don't want to spend too much time on this, you know, but their question, you know, you know, should we go or should we not, you know? And uh, I think that's the first question they ask. And so, okay, go, you know, but they get beaten. It's like, what did we do wrong? And so the question progresses from should we go, should we not, to final question, the third question they ask God, what should we do? And that's a humble question, right? And this is when God said, okay, this is what you do, and that's when he destroyed Benjaminites. Uh, we have the attack on AI, right? The second battle, the first battle, Jericho, right? And the second battle, oh, you know, don't worry, we'll just go ourselves. You know, we we'll, don't have to send the whole nation. We'll just send a few troops and we'll be fine. And they get, of course, chased out. I think 18 people paid, paid their life uh, for that mistake, all right? Because we, to, to, you know, it's, just, it's an easy target, right? Oh, well, we can do this. That's, uh, well, uh, of course, you have a uh, fight against Philistines during Eli's priesthood, right? They brought the Ark of the Covenant. And then they had a party, and they were, and the Philistines started to be a little bit worried. They're like, what's going on? They must have, this, you know. And they were full of confidence. Let's go for it. And they went to the battle, and they got slaughtered. Right? Um, we see Ahab's final battle, right? All his prophets say, yeah, you can do it. And they would take horns. And he, just like I have these horns, you're going to be able to push the enemy or whatever, right? And that's where Ahab died, you know, and it was a slaughter. Um, so Bible clearly shows us that God does not appreciate high look, doesn't appreciate a proud and person that's overconfident with his own ability. All right. Uh, sometimes he takes you and puts you down. <laughs> there's quite a few. Uh, they're kind of funny. Uh, there's quite a few videos on the Internet um, of guys that actually uh, celebrate too quickly. So there's this goalie. Uh, and he, there's a penalty, uh, so soccer, eh? there's a penalty and the goalie catches the ball, you know, and he celebrates and everything. But what happened with the ball, it's kind of bent over him, it's kind of bounced and bounced to his net. And, but he is like, oh, all right. And then the other guy that actually uh, shot, the, shot, shot the ball there, you know, he's like, oh, you know, that's too bad. That's such a great opportunity. But then he looks. And then he, the ball bounces, and he goes to the referee, see, see, see. They say, yeah, 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 it's a goal. But it's so embarrassing for the guy, right? You know, for the, for the goal. Because what is so embarrassing? Because he's so celebrated so, so quickly, right? You know, do not boast. Uh, the Bible says somewhere in the Proverbs, you know, do not boast when you go to the battle, you know, when you gird yourself. Boast after you come back, you know, but don't boast before you go to the battle. <clears throat> I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not to give another, neither my praise to graven images. See, uh, it's something we need to uh, learn, that uh, all the glory has to go to the Lord. And if we come out of the battle and we get the glory, uh, it's just not right. And, uh, and sometimes God will almost make sure, okay, you're too strong, because <laughs> then you get all the glory. I'm going to make you weaker, 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 weaker. Okay, now you're almost impossible to win, and now I'll bring you victory, right? And who gets the glory? Not the guy. The Lord gets the glory. So um, let's not think too high of ourselves. And by the way, thinking of too high of yourself and too low of yourself is in some ways the same problem 
is just the flip side of the same flaw, all right? Um, either you trust yourself or you uh, don't trust yourself, but both is about yourself. Right? So that's the problem. So we have to shift our trust from me or another person, because Bible says, you know, cursed be the man that trusted the man, right? So we had to learn to put our trust and shift it uh, from us, me, to, to the Lord. Now, um, what we are going into a little bit now is also uh, the, the problem with the trust is often actually a matter not necessarily putting too much on yourself, but it's just having a lack of faith, all right? The reason why we feel weak and indecisive or weak in a battle is because you don't have faith. That's what we see in the battle against the Philistines uh, and Goliath, is that everybody was there so afraid, didn't know what to do, you know, and kind of in the a, in a trenches, right? Um, but uh, when there is a lack of faith, there is a plenty of fear. And here, there is not time to encouragement. It's a time of rebuke. You know, when we have uh, that kind of attitude, because we don't trust the Lord, it's time to rebuke. And it's not right when, uh, when we are um, hiding because we don't trust God. <clears throat> so just because you think of yourself low, it's not always a sign of humility. Uh, it can be actually a sign of pride, of all things. Uh, because you would not put your trust to the Lord and you kind of keep it for yourself. And that's why you're afraid. <clears throat> uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. Let's open that one. Hebrews eleven thirty-two. While you're looking for it, um, uh, I'll remind you of the... Um, of the, uh, uh, of the story when uh, uh, the spies were sent to the land to spy the land, and they came back, but they brought a bad report. And they said, um, uh, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report, and they poisoned the whole group to a point that they all started to be very low-minded and they didn't go actually to the promised land as a result. And uh, that's not the, the weakness we were looking for, where you give up and let the Lord rule. No, this is actually you put the emphasis on yourself and we are not able to do it, we are nobodies, and that was evil and we are punished for it. So Hebrews 11, 32, what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon. Of course, you know that the chapter 11 is a chapter of these champions. Ah, let's not use the word champions. Uh, it's the examples of faith, all right, throughout the scriptures. But uh, the Bible says here, For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Notice one of the attributes of these people. What did they do through the faith? They came from weakness, out of weakness were made strong through the faith. So our strength can be I uh, can come through the Lord. And I know the Bible says that God didn't, didn't give us uh, uh, the spirit of fear, right? But he gave us the spirit of power. Uh, is it love and of a sound mind, right? Uh, see, when we have a fear, it's not from God. It's not, I mean, the only fear that perhaps is from God is the fear of God. You know, and one of the attributes of Jesus that he had the fear of the Lord, right? You know, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. But other fear is fleshly and is bad, and is a result. And as a result, uh, we become lame and weak and so on. And it doesn't have to be that way. You know, God. <laughs> see, the whole idea is, here is that God will take a weak and He will confine the strong in this world. So what is God going to do? He's going to somehow make you strong. Right? But it's going to be not through you. You don't compete with them. They're probably better. right? They're probably better in what are you trying to compete with them. Right? Better speaker. right? You know, 
you know, Christopher Hitchin, right? He's a great speaker, right? So sometimes you see these debaters, and they try to get the best debater in, in a Christian crowd and try to beat him. I'd say, no, I mean, it's the wrong battle, right? Let the, let's get to the least uh, interesting orator, you know, some lady, some home lady, and just, just, just say the truth, you know? And let, let God do the rest, right? <clears throat> so God can do much greater things than uh, any of these champions. But of course, if we try to compete with our strength, we'll probably get chased. We'll probably get beaten. Um, so God has a very different idea about a hero. Uh, you know, the world looks for champions, whether it's in sports and business and finance, you know, kings, governors, wrestlers, orators, any, any, anything in the world, right? The world is always looking for somebody best, all right? And it's always the top guy. If you're looking for a president, we're looking for the presidential type and, and all these things. Somebody handsome, somebody tall, you know. I think it would be an interesting day if we had a day when we had, uh, instead of uh, tall and handsome, uh, uh, hairy guy, maybe somebody actually uh, low statue, kind of little fat, bold, you know, maybe that would be a good guy. You know, unfortunately, these kind of people don't make it very far in today's media-driven politics, right? But if you look at some of the people in the history, they were not necessarily wonderful looking, right? Some of these great leaders. Um, um, and they had all kinds of infirmities. But um, today, of course, the world, especially with democracy and all that stuff, people look up to to handsome guy and tall guy. We're looking for souls. We're essentially looking for antichrist, what we're looking for, right? Somebody that will impress us. And of course, Jesus looks very weak on the cross. That's not what people like. But you know, he was actually very strong. And so who is our real hero? You know, the Lord is our hero. And so we will brag about the cross, you know? Because for me, the cross is not weakness. The cross is victory, right? He destroyed the devil on that cross. Now, going back to Paul. So Paul, we understand, was a wonderful preacher, right? I mean, he wrote so many epistles. Most of the epistles are written by Paul, and that's the chunk of the Bible, right? Uh, it's a chunk of the New Testament. The book of Romans is a masterpiece. Hebrews is a deep book. You know, Corinthian is a very long, and we're actually reading from Corinthians, right? He, you know, you have, you have a great impact by that man, all right? And so maybe we somehow assume this was a, somehow um, just a great man and somebody that makes a big presence. But uh, it's not quite like that. Uh, if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 2 <clears throat> Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 10, uh, from the beginning, we read, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold. Now what does it mean to be base? You know, we have the word basic. Base is something that's kind of ordinary. All right? It's not extraordinary, it's not unique, it's not special, it's not bold. You know, and here it actually is in a contradiction. Right? I, and in here I was base as opposed to bold, which I was when I was absent. But I beseech you that I may be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as we walk according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And I think what is happening here is that Apostle Paul is careful not to fight the, the spiritual fight with carnal tools. But what are the carnal tools? Well, it is again, you know, the boldness, the confidence, your pedigree, your titles, you know, you go up, you know, your ability to speak or whatever. And Paul is staking, st staying back and he says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. It's not this fleshly boldness and confidence, which is what the world is after. And he, and he stones it down. All right? Um, so the key also is understand that this is a different battle. It's not a fleshly battle. It's a spiritual battle. Therefore, it has to be fought with spiritual means. Second Corinthians chapter 11 now. All right? This is where we, what we read at the beginning. 
Uh, the Bible says there in verse 17, That which I speak, I speak not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly, in this confidence of boasting, seeing that many glory after the flesh. I will glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourself are wise. Eh? I, was, I would add to that. Excuse me. You know, for ye suffer, if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you in the face. I mean, think about the nonsense about that. That sometimes people elevate the people that then turn against them and become their masters. But the people look up to them. You know, I mean, how many girls, you know, would be, you know, looking up to, I don't know, Justin Bieber or some other dude. You know, but the Justin Bieber, you know, he, he's, he, he's coming to the podium and he says, I love you all, you know, but hey, he doesn't love you. You just go and see him face to face, like, who are you, right? He doesn't love you. He extracts money from you, you know, it's not a leader, you know, but that's the kind of leaders the flesh will look for, right? Some great guy, you know, and yeah, yeah, we love you, you know, he doesn't love you doesn't care for you. Verse 25, I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, in us over any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Now he is now going to go to a little bit overdrive. You th you're looking for somebody wonderful? Well, I am also great. You know, and then he goes through a list of, what, of his pedigree. I'm a Hebrew, I'm from Benjamin, I'm a Pharisee, all these things. But then he says, <clears throat> Um, um, if I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. Verse 30. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. You know, the, it's interesting that he says that he will glory in his infirmities. Infirmity is just another word for weakness and, and uh, flaws and that sort of thing. And he says he will uh, he, will, he will glory of the things. Or maybe you can say boast and be, be proud of things that I am weak in. Right? And that's an interesting concept. You, know? you don't see that on TV. You don't see that uh, you know, uh, taught in a great, you know, in Harvard and Princeton and all these universities, Yale, all these universities, uh, you know, as a sort of a thing to go to, to be, to be, to be a great leader in this world. You know, no, no, no. It's, it's just about the opposite. <clears throat> and again, 2 Corinthians 12, uh, verse 5. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself, Apostle says, I will not glory, but in my infirmities. Lest any man should think of me above that which he sees in me, or he that, uh, that he that of me. So Paul was very careful for people not to look up to him, but to look up to Jesus. All right, and uh, it's a great man. I like it, love it, right? And uh, and um, he even talks about his uh, this uh, thorn that he has in the flesh. That actually God puts it there so that he would not think of himself too high. Now we talked about it some time ago as well. So the Bible says, "My strength is made perfect in weakness." You know, verse uh, nine. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That is a great motto for our life. I will rather brag about all my weaknesses and wherever I am weak and let God come and show us his way. And uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes it takes uh, very much weakness. Uh, sometimes it takes a long time with no victory or with no progress or something like that, or weaknesses and, some, uh, and stuff like that. But then when things get around and we see something uh, suddenly be resolved or a victory of any sort in our life, then it makes us a lot more thankful to God because we appreciate Him a lot more, right? Where if, if, if everything's kind of easy formula, okay, here's a challenge, okay, let's tackle it, and it's done, who gets the glory? 
you know, you get the glory, right? You know, even in your mind. Uh, and it's easy then to talk to, to anybody. Oh, I, I was, uh, you know, it's, it's, right? So there's a different subliminal ways to kind of show you're somebody, right? <clears throat> now, he's another man that's very similar to Paul, and that's Moses. And I find Moses very interesting. Moses had a period of life where he was full of strength. We've got to do something. We've got to stand for the truth and for the justice and for our people, right? This is God said, no. And he sent him to the wilderness for 40 years. And after 40 years, when God calls Moses, we see Moses a very different man. They say, no, nah, not me. I can't talk. And people make uh, Moses like a liar, like he cannot talk. I believe him. I, he probably had some problem with speech. You know, he's like, I can't talk. I can't talk. Okay, I'll give you Aaron. You know, can talk for you. It's almost like God said, you don't need to talk, you know. But if you need somebody, okay, I'll give you Aaron, right? And Aaron was not always the best friend. You know, it's almost like a burden sometimes. But whatever, you know. I believe he had a problem with speech. He had infirmity. He spent 40 years alone. When he was 40 years alone in the wilderness, he probably lose a lot of abilities to orate and to, to be bold among a lot of people, right? So, but this is where God wanted Moses to be. And then, okay, it's time to go. It took 40 years. You know, you think when, when he was 79 years old that he was thinking, okay, it's almost here. Next year, you know, life is going to change. No, for him, this was the end, right? This is what, you know, raise kids and give grandkids, and that, that was the life. <clears throat> so sometimes we may feel that our, whatever we struggle for or whatever, it feels like there's no end in sight. And you're slowly moving, and it feels like it's not happening. Maybe that's where God wants us or wants you, you know, to a point where all hope is last, lost, right? And this is where God comes and he comes strong. <clears throat> now, um, let me just uh, finish with uh, my testimony a little bit. Um, I personally, like all of us, I'm sure, have experienced when we are very confident, but also experienced when we are completely um, missing some kind of self-esteem, right? And obviously, having no confidence is not fun, all right? Because you, you get red face, you, get, uh, you, you lose the speech, you don't know what to say, you stumble, uh, uh, you don't know what to say. You know, shy, you may be quiet, uh, you may be submissive, weak, defensive, uh, and in general, may be viewed as a loser. All right? We all have been there, I think, right? We all have been there. Uh, but that's not what God wants from us. It's not like God is taking pleasure when we are a loser. You know? It's just He needs us you know, being loser and being weak is not necessarily virtue. So it's not something to kind of um, brag about as a virtue itself. All right? The reason we, we boast in weaknesses is because we are waiting for God to show His power. So we very much enjoy having power. We very much enjoy God come strong and uh, deliver a victory. So we're not worshiping you know, being nobodies and stuff like that. You know, uh, you know, when it says, when I'm weak, then I'm strong, right? The focus is on the strong. And sometimes the path to the strength is through weakness. <clears throat> um, so um, the Bible clearly tells us uh, in many places that we ought to pursue strength and boldness and so on. You know, Apostle Paul, he says, you know, pray for me that I may be bold uh, when giving a gospel, when I'm standing in front of a council. Even the Holy Spirit, you know, Jesus says, hey, don't be worried when they brought you to the councils, right? You know, I will give you words. You just say whatever comes and, and just say, I will be with you, you know? So it's not like God, when he says, you know, that we shall suffer persecution, it's not like this, leaving us alone to just complete the embarrassment, all right? Uh, no, God is going to come strong, even through our testimony. To Joshua, God says, be strong and have a good courage, right? So that's what, we, that's what we strive for. It's just it has to come from the faith and not from our strength. We don't copy some other guy out there 
uh, that may be um, strong and try to reach to, to his or her level, uh, that's, not what, that's not what we're looking for it. We're looking for it through the Lord. <clears throat> and of course, in order to accomplish something, if you look at all the battles, even those that, you know, like whether, whether it was uh, David and Goliath, you know, it took Indiana strength, didn't it? Right? You did the Gideon, uh, when they, with the 300 uh, of his people, when they destroyed the, ha the army of half a million, you know, there was a strength, there was actually a sword, and there was a the, the different power demonstrated. It just was not from those people muscles. The power came from somewhere else. But it was there. And um, uh, so we, when we defeat an enemy, when we need to face uh, challenges in our life or build something great, strength indeed is required. But let it be God's strength and not ours. So once again, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Fear is not uh, our path. We need confidence all right, for the battle. Question is, Again, what is our confidence built and standing on? Uh, that's what really matters. Um, so, to conclude, you feel weak, you feel inadequate, you feel like you're not making progress. That could be. Uh, let that uh, heaviness and discontent with feeling you're not making a progress. Let that be channeled somewhere. It could be channeled towards getting, okay, I need to get stronger, or uh, look for allies, or let that be channeled somewhere else. Let that be channeled to the cross. Admitting our infirmities and uh, Maybe what is happening, God is kind of doing two things at the same time. He wants to get uh, you the help you need, but may, maybe also wants to accomplish something in you, right? And that can happen in the process. But what, what if we are always strong, we've always been in a battle, nothing will happen to us, and we'll just become very proud. Um, you know, the Bible says that uh, God uh, uh, despises the proud. Right? But he lifts up those that are humble. So humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. So sometimes that's what needs to be accomplished, and perhaps that's why we have challenges. And that's why we are facing difficult enemies. All right? So let's, let, let, that, that be, uh, let, let, let that be the, the result of our, of our struggle and of our uh, pain and tears, and go from there. Amen? All right? When I'm weak, then I'm strong. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, I thank you for the cross. Uh, Lord, uh, this world is, uh, has a lot of confidence and boasting. There is a lot of great people who have accomplished great things. They have a lot of glory. And when they show up, there is a lot of applause and, and, uh, and excitement. But when we show up on a scene... Uh, people are disappearing or whatever it is. Lord, uh, teach us, Lord, to trust and put all our trust in you alone. Not in our abilities, not in someone else's abilities, not in money, uh, not in uh, Goliaths of this world. But let us put trust, uh, our trust, our, uh, our security and everything else in you and you alone. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.